coming through the window and it's shining right on this pulpit and it's, there's sunshine coming in and that always makes us feel good but I'm thankful that we can have the sunshine of his love within and, and you know sometimes as, you know, as I go through my work week you know I being the we have a small church I, I, I have worked all my adult life in a place of employment and sometimes it can be very stressful uh, especially in times where business is slow and, and uh, you know, the boss is not happy with things you know it can be very stressful and, and uh, you know uh, you know God told Adam that by the sweat of his brow he would eke out his existence and I'm just so thankful that in a, in a sometimes tough and difficult world, and of course as we get older, there's other issues that come along, but uh, besides all that, we can have, still have joy, we can still have peace, we can still have the sunshine in our soul, and I'm so thankful for that tonight. But we're going to bring Pastor Sherry to the pulpit, and uh, I'm just going to pray for her that uh, God would anoint her. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our sister in the Lord, Lord God, and we thank you for her knowledge and for her burden that she has, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you would anoint her words, Lord, that it would speak to us this evening, Lord, and that it would give us direction and, and uh, help us to draw closer to you. We just pray and ask of your name, in Jesus' name. preaching. He was, going, he was doing pretty good. <laughs> I was saying, you don't need me up here. Jesus is already here anyways. But um, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for all that God's doing here. Um, new members, can you hear me okay? okay. We had a couple that, before we left today, she said, that message that Pastor Rick had spoken, she said, it just really, really touched their hearts, really changed some things, and they've got a new direction, and, and they're planning on marriage, but, you know, they got to get all the things set, set down in place, but, um, you know, God's working on people's hearts, and we've got a new member that, she's been coming three weeks now, and she said, she said, I love this church. She said, I enjoy coming. And from the first day she came to today, you could see just the glow in her eyes and just the smile. She was smiling, and it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful thing. And, and having Sassy with us this, this month, and it's, it's been an awesome um, <clears throat> time for me because I miss her when she's not here. And uh, I only get to see her every year to every couple, you know, two years, but uh, she's a good friend of mine, and I consider her my sister, a true sister, and uh, we're pretty close, but um, uh, I enjoy, you know, the, the time we have together, that God uh, moves upon Sassy, and she has a word and such a testimony that she'll share, she'll share soon, but um, I'm just thankful for this church and the love that's here, the true love, and uh, the hearts that are open and willing to follow after whatever God leads us to do. And that's what this message tonight's about, the blessing of a willing heart. And sometimes we don't understand, you know, when I when it came to my mind and I was thinking about it, it is a blessing to have your heart open to follow after whatever God asks of us to do, no matter how hard that may be. That's a blessing. There's blessings that come to us just because our heart is open to that. We deal with a world that is so dark and, and hard-hearted and, as God calls us, stiff-necked people. You know, just so much that we're seeing and dealing with, even in our own families, that, you know, we miss the blessings that will come to us each and every day just by having that heart open and asking God to lead us. God, whatever you want me to do today, whatever you want me to say to this person or that person, whatever you want me to do or go, or to, to speak to someone about or teach in Sunday school or, you know, whether it's going to my neighbor's house or taking cookies to someone. And whatever it is, that heart is open to those blessings. 
Well, we're going to talk about some of the blessings, but let's go to Proverbs chapter 16, 1 through 3. Anyone that could stand, if you can't stand, don't, don't worry about it. We're going to open up scripture. Let's give God the glory that he deserves, and um, we're respecting him by, by lifting him up and standing in, in the opening of the scripture. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Thank you, Jesus. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. If we are committing our heart, you can sit, you can be seated. We are committing our life unto him. Oh, what a peace that is to know that you're not on this journey by yourself or following after a fleshly person, but you have a God in heaven, a God that's here, a God in our hearts that is directing you and I each and every moment of the day. We can't do it without him. We need to stop trying to do it without him. And we try in our own fleshly efforts to to do what we think we should do, and, and we're doing it for naught. But when God leads us, and we say, God, whatever you, wherever you lead me, I shall follow. That is the kind of heart that blesses God. It blesses him to know that he doesn't have to struggle to try to get these stiff-necked people to worship and praise him or go where he wants. You know, that's where my mind, I'm thinking in my heart when he's thinking, I need to ask them to go do this, but they're going to complain. They're going to say, but God, I've got to do this. But God, I don't have time. But God, that's what some people do at times. And maybe we've all done it at times in our fleshly ways. When he says, I need you to go now, or I need you to call that person now, we need to listen and obey, don't we? When, when he's pricking our spirit to do that. God loves a willing heart. I know there's times that, you know, Rick tries to do things around the house, and I, I say, well, why don't you have... You know, Mark, help you. Well, he doesn't want to help. I've asked him before. And if he don't want to help, I'm not going to ask him. You know, that kind of thing. And, and God has to feel the same thing about us. You know, it's no different. Father, son, he's our father. We're his children. It's like they're not going to do it. If I ask them, they'll complain. But it just came, it comes to reality how God wishes that we would just be so free in him to listen and follow after him. If a heart is not willing, he'd rather not ask us to do anything. So God wants a cheerful servant, willing and open to follow him. In Exodus 35, Pastor Rick, I'm going to have you read um, verses 4 through 35. I want you to listen to these scriptures on what the people of God did. What was their heart like? And Exodus chapter 35, verses 4 through 35. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of, of the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, and oil for the light, and spices for anointing oil, and, and the sweet incense, and onyx stones, and stones to be set for an ephod, and for a breastplate. And every wise-hearted among you shall come, and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent, and his coverings, his, his tatches, his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets the ark and the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and its staves and all his vessels and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps and the oil for the light, and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering of the tabernacle, the altar for burnt offering with its brazen gate great his staves and all his vessels and the labor and its foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hangings for the door of the court, the pins for the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the claws of service that 
to do service in the holy place and the holy garments for Aaron and his priests and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. And all the congregation and the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred, stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, uh, offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering, and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were white-hearted did spin with their hands and brought, and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and, and for the anointing oil and, and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for a manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called, you, called my name. Behold, the Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to devise curious works, to work of gold and of silver and in brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in the carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Ahiliab and the son of Asishemach of the tribe of Dan. Then hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and the cunning workman and the embroider in blue and in purple and in scarlet and fine linen and of the weaver even to them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. Amen. He got everyone whose heart was stirred and brought, whose heart was willing, the spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle. It's willing, the heart, the spirit that was willing, they gave. And even in verse 36, Moses had to stop them from giving. They wanted to continue to keep giving so much, and he said, wait, 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 we have all that we need right now. You know, I'm sure he said, thank you for such a giving heart. But in 36, he asked them to wait. They bring too much. And, and that was the blessing. Their heart was just over, overflowing with that spirit of giving, that willingness to do whatever God asked of them. And we know that the children of Israel wasn't always like this. They, they grumbled and complained. And we do that sometimes, too. we got to catch ourselves. But they did. They worried. They, they, they just, you know, they weren't happy. And that they weren't, things weren't good enough. The food that God brought them, they murmured. And, you know... You wonder how God kept himself from just, we know he repented that he made them. And I imagine today even God feels in his heart, oh, these people, these people. But he's coming soon, isn't he? He's coming soon. We don't have to go to a tabernacle, the tent, to go worship God or see him. He's here now. He's here, isn't he? Because of Jesus Christ, he's here in our hearts. And he goes wherever we are. Wherever we will commune with him, he's here. And so many discount his presence, and they won't talk to him or spend time with him. Or when he asks of them to do things, I can't. I'm not smart enough. I don't know how to do that. God, I can't do that. But he equips those that he calls. He doesn't call professors or, you know, men of great money and, or, you know, to fulfill a place. He equips us in our little fleshly minds, our fleshly hearts. He's saying, I picked you. I want you to do this. And I will lead you and guide you in every step of the way. That's the way God is. As long as we have that willing heart open 
to him and his presence, to follow after him, to listen to him, to care about what he feels. You know, we need to pray, God, break my heart on things that break your heart so that I may be sensitive to your spirit, sensitive to the things and people around me that I will understand, that I will see what you see. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Brother Mark, would you like to read that? Sorry, my mouth is getting dry. First Samuel chapter 16, verse, verse 7. 7. <clears throat> but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? You don't have to be six foot tall and slim and olive skinned or a certain color of hair to be chosen by God. He doesn't care about what you look like on the outside. It's here. And that's what we've got to give to people. He cares about who you are here, not whether you have a handicap or whether you've got a heart condition or what skin disease, what he cares about that, but that's not going to be a prerequisite of him choosing who he wants to choose to do a specific work, a calling. He's called each and every one of us to follow after him, to pick up our cross daily, to be led and guided by him, have an open heart, an open spirit to him, his heart, to know him, to feel his presence, at any time, a sensitivity. And that's what he asks of us. Just let me be part of your life. Let me lead and guide you. Let me be your God. Let me be your eyes. Let me let me speak to your heart so I can give you understanding, so I can give you wisdom and direction. That's what God wants to give us. We don't have a lot of time yet in this earth, do we, to, to be worried about ourselves. He's gonna, he's gonna take care of our needs our physical bodies. We, yes, we're getting older. Our bodies are not doing what we would like them to do. And, but he's going to take care of us, isn't he? You know, you think of those that God used in the Word of God. They, they became old. And I'm sure they got a little slower. But he used them till the day of their death. We don't stop, do we? It doesn't stop no matter what age we're at. We are still a child of God sent by him to reach the world, a lost and dying world, to love them, to give them comfort, to give them truth, to give the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our job. That is our purpose. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He chooses whom he chooses. And it's not for us to question that, is it? He will choose whomever he wants to bless. He will choose. The blessings, you know, and I know we're not looking for these things, but there are five crowns that I found. There may be more. Pastor, pastor's here. He may know of more. But there are five crowns that the, the, the Bible mentions. And this is the key. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd of the whole flock and the heritage of God. All those who faithfully serve him will receive a crown of unfading glory infinitely better and more honorable than all the authority, wealth, and pleasures of the world combined. The key to receiving such glory is having a willing heart. Willing means with free will, cheerfully of one's own choice. Number one that I found was a crown of righteousness. It talks about it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. We've got, we were talking about this in Sunday school today, With I was talking to Mark, and I said, every day we need to be watching for him. We need to be ready, our heart just waiting for him, not getting so tied up on our, our age group, you know, these teenagers, and all they think a lot is about themselves, what they want to do today, what they want to do tomorrow, what their future may hold, where they need to understand their future must be in God. Right. Not in what, well, a lot of people go to college, 
But that can't be what drives us. Our focus needs to be on heaven. And there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And I want to go to heaven. And whether I get a crown of righteousness, I'm just going to, I don't care. I just want to be up there. I want to come in that door. If there are crowns for me, I don't, that's not my purpose, is it? But God wants you to know that because of your willing heart, he wants to bless you for what you've done in this life. The things, the people that you loved and cared about, the word that you gave to people in church, in homes, over the phone, on the internet, that you gave his word, that you kept on, that you looked towards him. He is the truth. He is the light. He is our father, our creator. He loves us and cherishes us. The second was the incorruptible crown. In 1 Corinthians, you might want to write this down, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. I want you to go back and study. Read this. Let your eyes see the word yourself so you understand. Don't ever take somebody's word. You find it in the scriptures. That's what we stand on, not somebody's ideas or philosophies. It's got to be the word of God. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for, for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. We want to be with Christ Jesus. All the awards in this world that anybody could be given mean nothing. They'll rust. They'll fall apart. Those medals, those those ribbons that people get, Olympic ribbons or things that get schools, they will fall apart. But anything within God is incorruptible. It will last for eternity. For eternity. God calls some of his people to do things that will require some sacrifice and temperance in the way that they will live and conduct their lives. God may ask me to do something that he won't ask you to do. Because he has specific things that he uses certain people for at times. It doesn't mean they're lifted up higher than you, because no one is greater than anyone else, only Jesus Christ. I am no better than you, and you're no better than me. We are just children of God, doing what he leads us to do, being led and guided by him daily, striving, striving to allow our life, our heart, our spirit to be led by him, that we will line up with his word, and we'll be directed by him, and we'll trust in him and stand on that. And that truth must be what leads us and guides us. And it must be the truth that we give to others. It must be. We can't tickle people's hearing. We can't tickle them to, to try to get them to like us. You may never have somebody like you because they don't want to adhere to what the Word of God says. That they'll never accept you as long as they want to have their hard heart and their own opinions their own philosophies God can't use those people he can't so you'll never be liked by some of those people and you got to accept it what's the Bible say shake off the dust off your boots your feet your sandals and go on go on they're rejecting him not you but we are that he's that light within us that they see and they don't like that they don't want to hear that they don't want to know that you anything that you got to say that refers to this word there's a lot of things in this world that's going on that they're trying to push aside. You know, all those are those Bible thumpers. Don't don't listen to them. Don't let them start doing things in the school system. Don't let them do this in, in our societal groups. I should say that's probably not the right word. But don't allow the prayer because then they're going to start just this Jesus thing. You don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Let's stop it. We're hearing about this all the time. Little kids just even praying for their lunches. God loves that little child, and God's going to bless that little child because they stood for what was right. And the parents stood for what was right. We cannot bow down to the things of this world, whether they like us or not. We've got to have the right heart and the right spirit. I'm not saying have that prideful, arrogant spirit, because that's not God. But to have that right spirit. That meek and loving spirit, but bold when it's necessary. Stand for what is right, no matter what. The third one was the crown of life. That's the martyr's crown. We know that there are those that are killed for Christ's sake. Today, 
not just 1,000 years ago, 2,000 right. years ago. It's happening today, and I have seen, and I wish, well, no, I needed to see it. The things that we're seeing across the world, they're put on video. The arrogant spirit of murdering Christians. But I saw one, and I saw a Christian man. They were actually cutting his head off. And he did not cry out. He was praying. He was praying. Can you believe this? That's the way we, we need to, this is an example. Because he's our God, and if I die today, I'm in his hands. I have peace for the rest of my life, because I'm with him. I'll have eternity. And this man it just spoke volumes to me. He didn't tear up. The guy, you know, it was a jagged knife. It was a horrible thing. It was horrible. But he was such a witness to me. My goodness. These people are speaking to you know, Allah and all these things, yelling at him, and he's just praying to his God, Jesus Christ. And they're sitting there cutting his head off. And I was thankful that there are people today that stand for what the word says. They, stay, they know who Jesus Christ is, and they're standing boldly. No matter what you do to me, you can't take him away from me. And that's the way we've got to be. No matter what you may do or say about me or to me, or through me, you cannot take him out of here. He is my life. He's my heart. His spirit resides in here. Nobody can take that out. Only God himself. But that was a witness, a terrible witness, but it was a witness of what we should be. If ever something, the enemy comes towards us and, and it's, God chooses to take us, thank you, Jesus, because we'll be with him. It's all for him. That's that, that is that crown, the crown of life. The martyr's crown is in Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. I'm going to read verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast out some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation. Ten days be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Thank you, Jesus. Another one was a crown of rejoicing. That's the soul winner's crown. You know, there's nothing that does a heart good than to see people come to the altar. And they've listened to the message, and it pricked their heart. And they came forward because they knew, I've got to have Jesus. I need to change. God, forgive me. Take away these things. Help me with this flesh of mine. Help me to follow after you. When you see the tears, oh my goodness, the tears. Imagine what's going on in heaven when a sinner... Or anyone. We're all sinners saved by grace. We all have to repent every day. Comes to the altar where God wants them to come so that he can touch them and lift them up and strengthen them and heal them and give them peace in their mind and their heart and their spirit. Nothing is greater than seeing that. And you just feel a pinch of what God feels. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 20. I'm not... I, I want you guys to, to really study that. I'm only going to read 19 and 20 here. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his own coming? For ye are our glory and joy. It is a joy. That's a joy. Those that, are, that come and give their life unto the Lord, that's a joy that comes here. The crown of rejoicing, a soul winner, someone that reaches out for souls. And I know this church does that. I know it. I, I've seen it. I've felt it. I've heard it. The fifth one was a crown of glory. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop after this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And here, I want you to write down this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 through 11. Write it down. Study on it later. But as pastors, as leaders, we can't take this word and beat people up over with it. We give it with love and mercy and compassion. We don't say, if you don't do the way I tell you, you're, you know. It's got to be with love because Jesus talks to us with that love and mercy. 
How, why do we think that we have to, you know, knock somebody against the head to try to force them? Well, if you don't do what I think you should, then you're out. And there are churches like that. I'm not here. Not here. Because that's not Jesus Christ. That's not what God wants us to be like. It's always with love and great mercy and compassion. Because that's that same that Jesus gave, God gave us when we came to him. When I came to an altar in, in 1984, he didn't have somebody go grab me and just say, you need to be right here and pray. I willingly, I knew through the preaching of the word, I, it was pricked in my heart. And no matter what fear I was feeling, because I didn't know these strangers, I knew I needed to come here. Because he was much bigger than anything I ever felt in my life, that love, that pure love. And that's what Jesus is drawing people by, his love, his mercy. You can't draw anybody any other way. And there, there is true that some preaching, it's got to be about heaven and hell issues. You know, we're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. And we've got to preach that because it is true. But you do it with love and mercy and grace, God's grace through his word. But he didn't, he, no one hit me over the head that day and told me what I had to do. I knew I had to come to him. And that's what it's about. It's about that willing heart. God's tabernacle is within us. Yes, we have a church. And we have pastors, leaders. We're all, we're all ministering. God uses each and every one of us to reach this city, to reach our families, to reach each other to comfort and strengthen and uplift and sometimes correct. But it's not this church building that saves you and I. It's only Jesus Christ. There's a lot of buildings, church buildings, people go into and they have no relationship with them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's all about friends and talking and gathering together and they've lost the purpose where that building is more of a cold, empty place. But you got to have a church that you can walk into and feel his anointing, his spirit, his love, his mercy, his grace. And that's a church. When God is in the midst, you can feel it. It's a beautiful, peaceful feeling. Let's all stand. God, help us to have a willing spirit, a willing heart to follow after you. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this house. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each and every one that you've given to us to love and to, to be a part of our life as well as we theirs. Lord, we just don't take it for granted. Lord, help us to keep our heart and our spirit right at all times. We want to be open to you, open to your anointing, open to what you need to speak to each and every one of us about. Change us and purge us with your word. Help us to line up with your word. Lord, we just you're our Father, and we just love you. And we want to give you the glory in all things, because you are the Father. You are the creator of creation and this earth. You created each and every one of us, and you love us in such a depth that we may not ever understand. But we're so thankful for that love and mercy, yes. for your saving yes. grace, for all that you've already done for each and every one of us. I give you the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Jesus. That's a good sign.
analogy, and uh, I may have shared it here, but some years ago I was looking through this gardening magazine and I seen where they sell these plastic, clear plastic molds. And then as you're, you put it around your, your small vegetables and as they grow, they take the shape of the mold. So you can have a green pepper that, that has the shape of a face and might be smiling or laughing or whatever. And, and you know, green peppers and tomatoes, whatever, it just, it grows and it conforms to that mold. You know, and the Bible says that we are hidden in him. You know, when, when we have the blood of Jesus Christ on our life and we've been baptized in him, you know, our life is hidden in his life. And when the Father looks down upon us, he doesn't see our failings and our, our, our failures, but uh, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees the image of the Son. But that's not the end of the story. As we grow in grace, we conform to the image of Christ. We can be more and more like him as each day goes by. I'm thankful for his love for us. And, and so we are hidden. We're, we're hidden in that rock called Jesus Christ. Is there another song on someone's heart that they would like to sing?